Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World. Later in the programme, the Paralympic sprint champion whose prosthetic legs now enable him to compete, the only person who's done this, to compete with able-bodied athletes. Amazing story. The Vice Foreign Minister of South Korea on the increasing tensions in his peninsula. And the Army General who came up with the surge in Iraq, focusing on Iraq and Afghanistan today. But first, synthetic life. Two years ago, you may remember, when I interviewed the US geneticist Craig Venter on this program. At that time, he had announced that he and his team had created the world's first synthetic man-made genome. But as he told me, there was still one more stage he wanted, indeed he had, to take. We are trying to transplant the synthetic chromosome uh, into uh, some cells to see if it will uh, take over those cells. Uh, but these cells grow extremely slowly. They take about six weeks before you even see enough of them uh, to know that an experiment has worked at all. Uh, so it's very tedious work. Uh, but as I said, I hope that will happen sometime this year. I, I've said that I will be uh, surprised and disappointed uh, if the team's not able to achieve that. Well, it took a bit longer than that. But here we are, two years later, and as the world's press heralded this week, he's done it. So I'm delighted to be joined again from the USA by Craig Venter. Congratulations, Craig, on your latest achievements. Around the world, not least in the old economist here, um, it's been uh, said that you have created life. What has enabled you to do that? Well, in fact, let me uh, put that in context. And David, it is great to be with you again. So. Uh, uh, what we did is, normally, as you know, we've been reading the genetic code of uh, various species, including the human genome, 10 years ago. When we read the genetic code, we've been digitizing that information in the computer. Now we've reversed the process. We're starting with the digital code in the computer, uh, four bottles of chemicals. We designed and built a chromosome based largely on an existing uh, bacteria. We made that DNA, inserted it in a recipient cell, and that converted that cell into the species dictated by the chromosome. So we certainly have not created life from scratch, as uh, some of the headlines have said, but we certainly have uh, uh, now created a cell that uh, its entire genetic code was generated from a computer sequence. And what does that mean in terms of its effects, Craig? What is it leading us to be able to do? Well, this is definitely an early prototype experiment, although it's taken us 15 years to get to this stage, all the new technology we had to develop even to make these large DNA molecules. So this is a proof of concept. So it means it's now possible to work from the computer and make a lot more changes to cells than we have in the past. Uh, existing molecular biology has been limited to uh, one to maybe a dozen or so changes uh, in all the uh, cells that have been out there uh, doing different things, such as DuPont's uh, E. coli strain that makes a uh, chemical uh, from sugar. Uh, we've been pretty limited as molecular biologists. This now gives us the ability to vary uh, all the sequences in, in a genome uh, and get that booted up to make new bacterial cells. And so what is the next step that you want to take? Well, there's two directions. One, we want to keep the basic science research going to try and understand the minimal gene content for life, knowing which genes are essential, uh, so we really understand cellular function. It's amazing, with all the biological advances, there's not a single cell where we understand all the genes in that cell and what they do. So I, I think that's important just to advance uh, science. But we also see a lot of practical implications of this new technique. Uh, some of the first things people will see is new synthetic vaccines uh, that allow us to respond much faster to new emerging infections. It's even uh, possible that the flu vaccine you'll get next year could come from these synthetic processes. On the long range, uh, programs we have trying to convert carbon dioxide 
into fuel molecules, food molecules, et cetera, I, I think is uh, one of the more exciting uh, potentials as we go from 6.8 to 9 billion people on this planet. And uh, you're seeking some patents, uh, many patents, in fact, in this field. One critic over here, whom I think you know of, Professor John Sulston, uh, has warned that efforts to patent the first synthetic life form, and that's you he's talking about here, I guess, would give its creator a monopoly on a range of genetic engineering. Is that true? Th those are just silly statements, uh, but the intellectual property is a very important part of this. If we just publish a paper in a top scientific journal, that's not going to get new fuels to the market in a cost-effective fashion. It's not going to get new vaccines out there. It's not going to be a source of new medicine. So I think most of the world understands that, that intellectual property is an important part of developing new scientific ideas, new scientific breakthroughs into things that actually affect people and affect the world. So uh, we're pushing it in that direction. There's so many labs now around the world uh, working on synthetic biology uh, that it would just be a, a silly notion that anybody could have a monopoly on it. Do you still feel that the work you're doing can help to solve, for example, global warming? Well, it's not clear that it can be solved with these technologies. I, I've thought for some time that biology could be an important contributor to the solution. It's such a vast problem. We burn so many billions of gallons of uh, oil and, and billions of tons of coal that we need more than just one technological fix. But I think biology can be an important contributor. We need liquid fuels if we can make those from carbon dioxide. We're going to need new food sources without wiping out uh, uh, every forest and, and swamp uh, on the planet. Uh, so we need to get a real set of breakthroughs to enable us to produce more food, uh, fuel from clean, renewable sources, clean water, which is one of the biggest problems in the future, and uh, medical care uh, for 9 billion people. Uh, how are we going to do that when we can't do that now for 6.8 billion without some new scientific advances? I think what we've uh, announced last week is one of the new tool sets that we think can help lead in the positive direction. Freeman Dyson, the physicist, said of your work that the ability to create new life forms marks a turning point in the history of our species and of our planet. Do you feel that? I, I think it has that potential. It's a very nice compliment uh, from Freeman. Uh, Ham Smith, uh, the Nobel laureate who's been working uh, with me for uh, over 15 years now, uh, and I feel this is a very powerful technology, and it, it's as much a philosophical breakthrough as a technical one. Uh, it helps us understand life, uh, and if we can uh, maneuver and manufacture different microorganisms uh, to be the next uh, uh, production facilities uh, for food and fuel, uh, I think it will be an important advance. When we last spoke, you allayed many of the fears that people had of bioterrorism by saying that your techniques were prohibitively expensive, which would prevent that. But the costs have, in fact, tumbled since then, haven't they? I think uh, what many people are viewing this latest breakthrough is certainly a linear increase in the negative potential, but an exponential increase in the positive uses. So. Any new advance in science in the, this day and age, we have to be cognizant uh, that there is negative potential. Right now, we have a very skilled uh, team, and I would say at this moment, we're the only ones on the planet that can do this research. Uh, but we have published our methods in the scientific literature, and eventually there'll be others. This won't be something anybody's doing in their garage soon at this scale. Greg, what's been the biggest turning point in your life? I read a lot about the time when you swam out to sea, intending to end it all, and then suddenly decided to turn back. Was that a crucial moment? Well, I think is going from a uh, young man uh, to 
experiencing, unfortunately, what many people around the world uh, are still in, uh, you know, exposed to being dropped in the middle of a, a war uh, for a year as a medic and treating uh, a very large number of casualties had a profound uh, impact on my life. Uh, uh, it severely depressed me, but uh, I came back from that and decided uh, to spend my life trying to do something uh, to see what my knowledge, uh, my experience could do to help change the planet. So obviously that was a turning point. I, I think it changed the direction of my life, yes. The novelist <laughs> Robin Cook said, the scientist's life should be one of imagination and joy. And in his case, that's your case he was talking about, it is. Is your life one of imagination and joy? It's been Craig? an incredible ride. I, I think I've had the most privileged scientific career uh, being there at the, the very beginning of and being able to sequence the first genome in history, uh, doing the first human genome, and now uh, developing the first uh, synthetic genome and synthetic cell. Uh, I've learned an incredible amount and we just hope that uh, these tools uh, really have a, a, a wonderful impact. It, but every day has been a day of wonder and joy with all the discoveries. Uh, working with my colleagues uh, uh, it's just been an incredible experience and I hope to keep doing that for as long as possible. Well, we do too. We hope you do. Often in television you cover the past and you cover the present. But I think that today we've been covering the future too. And we thank you so much indeed, Craig. So good to hear you again. Well, David, it's uh, any time. Uh, you, you, you reach a unique audience uh, that's very important to reach, and I, I'm happy to have that opportunity. Our thanks to Craig Venter there. In a minute, as tensions rise in the Korean Peninsula, We'll be talking to a Korean government minister about what's going on after this short break.